I think if we carry on like this, nobody goes home until about 7 o'clock this evening, actually, so we'll try and uh, speed it along. One of the fun things about coming in and not having been part of this event uh, until about an hour and a half ago is I don't know what everybody has said in the last day and a half. But I can probably guess that at least half of the presentations have the same content. What is, what is IoT versus what is M2M? And a number of other things besides. I was asked to talk briefly about the challenges as you move out into multinational and uh, global deployments. And as a result, thought that I would actually try and make a bit of fun out of it by picking a particular market segment to, uh, to talk about. And so picked natural resources, specifically oil and gas. And, and we'll use that as some of the uh, subject matter for the next uh, 15 minutes or so. Just a little bit about Core. Uh, I think there's quite a lot of people in the room that know who we are, but there's equally quite a lot that don't. Uh, we're the largest non-carrier provider of managed connectivity solutions for the machine-to-machine, -machine, that's the business-to-business -business high reliability marketplace, on a global basis, operations in a number of markets. We've shipped around 2 million devices to marketplace, uh, been in business 10 years. I won't give you the rest of the advertorial. Just go to corewireless.com, and you'll see all about it. Operations, though, uh, significantly in North America, uh, Canada, United States, four data centers around the world, uh, sales and service and support operations in Asia, in Singapore, Melbourne, Australia, and in New Zealand, and 24-7 service support. When I say 24-7 service support, because we're selling high reliability solutions to our customers, connectivity is a critical element of making those solutions work. We have warm body technical engineers supporting our customers' applications on a global basis, 24-7. What do I mean by integrated uh, managed services? Apart from our data center operations, we have more than 450 man years of development in our single service platform, which in the outside world we call PRISM. Um, essentially, multiple cellular, multiple uh, satellite carrier services integrated into a single platform where you connect to us once, you get best of breed connectivity, best technology, best regional support, which is relevant to the particular application that, you, that you're going to be deploying. That's all about core. Because what I'd like to talk about is the ecosystem of oil and gas. Because we can think of oil and gas and natural resources in one form. We think about the wellheads and whatever goes wrong when a BP oil uh, spill takes place. But in reality, you've got lots and lots of different elements being used in that one industry. And they have very different requirements from a connectivity point of view, very different requirements from a regulatory point of view, different usage profiles, and different points of, of criticality. So we've looked here at regulatory influences, safety at work considerations, environmental controls, uh, regulatory from a telecoms perspective, as well as re regulatory from the industry perspective. And then, of course, there's the supply chain and transportation related services. For those of you that live in North America or read North American press, you'll see that we've been pretty good at actually derailing um, uh, uh, rail cars with uh, bitumen and oil reserves in them. We wiped out a, an entire uh, town in Quebec um, just before Christmas. Uh, we wiped out more than 20,000 acres of farmland in Nebraska in January when we managed to spill oil all over the, the land, which either catches fire or pollutes the water tables. So the transportation side becomes a critical component as well when it's not going through pipelines. What's interesting about natural resources, and you can apply it to any forms of natural resource, but I've used oil and gas specifically, is that much of what takes place is operating in hostile environments. It's hostile from a climatic perspective. We've got operations in, on the north, north slope of Alaska with some of our customers. Not a very nice location. We have them in Nigeria, a different kind of not very nice location. And, and frankly, in some cases, dangerous. Uh, environments for people, in addition to the climatic hostilities. Oil and gas and natural resources naturally spans multiple geographies, multiple nations, multiple marketplaces, and with that bring lots and lots of different challenges from a connectivity perspective. They operate in emerging marketplaces oftentimes. 
These emerging marketplaces very often have very strict regulatory concerns, which telecom companies you can actually do business with, how you move the data in and out of the country, even, across the internet. You have to consider these as you drive out. Very much more difficult than just putting a service into a single country. Clearly, they're remote. They're 500 miles away from civilization, 1,000 miles away from civilization in a lot of places. And as David was talking about a little earlier in the context of Iridium, for example, um, short burst data services that cover the world are fantastic for exception-based and critical reporting. But more and more applications want to bring more and more data back. So some are moving into high bandwidth applications, wanting streaming video, status of what happened on that rail car when it crashed, and others. And what we're finding is that best effort is not good enough. People are building their business cases on the criticality of service delivery. You can build great products, but unless you've got great connectivity, you're screwed. You've got to be able to have it there all of the time. Because a high, there is a very high cost of failure. I think just a moment ago, somebody made a comment, I think it was David, commented on the $5 million catastrophe when, a, when an oil, oil tanker breaks. Well, trust me, it was a heck of a lot more than $5 million bucks when it went off the rails and wiped out the town in Quebec. So what's happening more and more in all industries, and you're hearing this, I'm sure, in the last day and a half from, from many of the speakers, if you can measure it, you can make better decisions, better business decisions. If you can measure it, bring it back to where you can make that decision, you've built an M2M application. And it's driving change in business processes, driving changes, as we're saying here, on liability in oil and gas. We're improving productivity of individuals. And now we're leveraging the forms of connection that are available on a global basis. Um, repeating and emphasizing a point that uh, uh, Dave Wiggles was just, just mentioned. He said, I think 90% of the world is not covered by cellular. I actually think the number's 92, actually. Um, and it's only improving by the rate of about 1% every 10 years. Okay, why? Because we build cellular networks for where people are. So the, the satellite networks become much, much more critical. And there's all sorts of different satellite services you can use. So, very quickly, you think about the obvious ones. Pipeline monitoring. For those in, uh, that have any dealings again with North America, you'll know that there's a, an off-again, off-again, and yet again, off-again discussion around something called Keystone XL, which is a pipeline to bring uh, tar sands oils from Canada down to refineries in Houston, Texas. Part of the specification of that is it has to be monitored every half a mile on a 3,000 3, 3 kilometer pipeline. Why? For environmental reasons. Now, you're not going to be able to do that with cellular. You'll be able to do it with cellular in some places, but you won't be able to do it with cellular with all. So a satellite becomes important. You're putting things along the pipe to monitor corrosion, leakage, all sorts of things like that. Keys are liability as well as integrity of the service solution that's being delivered to the customer. But what's interesting about it is that at certain routing points, just as you have in utility companies, you want live video feeds, and you look video feeds up through a pipe and look to see what's happening. So the blending of technologies into multi-mode devices, cellular satellite, is becoming increasingly important in that market. The key here is the common need is their remote locations and their multiple technologies typically being used. Go to a different version. Many of these locations have lone workers. Lone workers aren't just pizza delivery guys, which is the usual story of the lone worker. I want to know that he is safe when he's delivered the pizza. Well, these guys are lone workers on wellheads. They're lone workers in fields. They're loan workers, the security guards around difficult and hostile environments to protect the assets of businesses. You want to know, and you're required to know, what the safety and security aspects are for that individual person. Is he, is, do you have man down? Do you need voice services so you can talk to them? Different kind of applications in the same industry called oil and gas needing different connectivity solutions on a global basis. 
In that area, you're also looking at ways to be able to ensure that you meet your regulatory requirements now from an industry perspective, because the industry is forcing these changes in their man management policies. This is kind of an interesting one. I learned about three years ago, when I was visiting one of our very large customers, that something which most people in the room will, will know, those kind of giant tires that are used on the uh, equipment that's used on open cast mining and all sorts of other things, cost a lot of money. $100,000, $120,000 per tire. Problem is, there's a four year backlog of production on those tires. So large construction equipment is often delivered to customers tireless. And they take the tires off the old ones to put the new, new equipment into service. Kind of wild, isn't it? So making sure that those tires have a good chain of custody, that are being looked after correctly, are being maintained correctly, are critical because no tire, no production. Very, very critical area. So lots and lots of, of things taking place downstream, which you don't necessarily recognize as being relevant to that particular industry. Now, you can bring hybrid technologies there. You can bring Wi-Fi in a major, major construction site, private mobile radio, uplink, up, uplink it on either broadband satellite, IP satellite, or indeed on cellular, because you can put cellular base stations into place, potentially in a single mine facility. But those kind of areas become critical, but they need a different kind of usage profile. The business of people like us is being able to deliver the kind of services that are relevant to each of these unique marketplaces. Because us and other companies like us are in the business of building unique, high reliability connectivity solutions. Something to be, that, to be honest, is tough for the individual in-country licensed carrier who knows something about his own market, and that's all. Here in Britain, lots and lots of talk about uh, fracking, as I understand it. Uh, and whether you like it or not, it's coming. Why? Because it's part of the energy independence movement, just in the way that the environmentalists lost out to energy movements in North America. The largest single producer of shale gas today worldwide is the United States. It didn't produce any shale gases eight years ago. I mean, huge, huge changes in this market. But a lot of people think it's got lots of environmental issues, water tables being destroyed. Believe it or not, uh, earthquake monitoring, sh seismic shock reporting being required, and more and more at a regulatory perspective, both at a federal as well as at a state level, at least in North America, and I think it'll happen in exactly the same way here. Things like air quality and pollutant management is also critical. All of these are being pulled off sensor networks, some of which are moving very tiny bits of data, some of which are moving lots of data to collection points, then doing data analytics at that point, and then moving it upstream. The second is having pulled it out of the earth and hopefully not destroyed the planet doing it, then we're working on how do we get it from where it is to where we need it to be. And that's where the, the pipeline type application starts to come in. Why are people investing in this market? Well, number one, they're making a lot of money, so they're investing in it. Why are they investing in M2M to support it? Not because of productivity gains, but because of liability and insurance and other environmental movement uh, pressures. Because if they didn't do it, they wouldn't have the business opportunity to open the shale gas reserves in the first place. One of the interesting areas one of our customers is involved with here is actually managing the, um, the, man the amount of electricity that's used in pumping stations. Um, it's the largest single use of power in the entire oil and gas industry is actually uh, in uh, lift rod pumps. These things that you, know, you, you joke about, if you go to Texas, you, know, you see these arms moving around in the fields. Well, that's what these things are doing. Um, these things are being monitored consistently to optimize when they're being powered so that electricity isn't being applied to them when you've got sufficient pressure coming out of the, out of the ground to keep the pumps running, you switch the power off, 
When that drops away, you basically kick it back in again to get them running again. If you don't have ongoing management systems controlling that, you run the pumps all the time, electricity is being used all the time, drop, drives the costs up all the time. David mentioned distribution and the, the uh, accident rates there. Um, I think he even mentioned the name of a uh, provider, happens to be a customer of ours. Um, and what's interesting, I'll give you another statistic attached to it. One of the major oil companies uses that driver uh, mentoring um, application software on a fleet of around about 800 regional delivery vehicles. In the, this is in the United States. Since they installed it, their accident rate has dropped by 32%. Their, the actual cost per accident has dropped by 56%. But more importantly, their marketing department has turned it into a local benefit. They're, they're being kind to the community. And so they're using it in all sorts of different ways to demonstrate that they are good community citizens. And frankly, the oil and gas industry is not generally speaking seen as being a good community citizen kind of industry. I hope there's not too many from oil and gas in the room. So you've got driver behavior modification. Now, what's interesting about that, as David mentioned earlier again, is that technology is being moved into things like uh, transportation vehicles, uh, school buses, uh, long distance uh, coaches. And that whole mentoring technology is being used in that way, including live video feeds, which are using broadband services today. So in really trying to sort of wrap this thing up and try and keep this schedule moving along a little bit. What we're trying to do here is show that there's all sorts of different applications, even in one individual industry, that has got quite differing needs based upon the geographies, the regulatory environments, the use cases, the technologies that are going to be used to be able to uh, survive and thrive and take advantage of the broad IoT movement. The number one issue for business to business M2M is, is that corporations are building their business models to depend on this technology. That's pretty important because traditionally the cellular industry has been a best efforts industry. Let's be honest. You know, we get up every morning and we're pretty tolerant when it takes few minutes for our phone to register when we got off the aeroplane or, you know, we drop the call and we get into the elevator, etc., etc., etc. Well, we're human beings. We're smart enough to fix it. You know, we switch it on, switch it off, say, don't worry, I'll call you back. Machines don't behave that way. So the applications have to be di driven differently. But more importantly, the network connectivity toolkits from the providers needs to be different for the user experience. Uh, to be acceptable for these devices with an additional dimension. These devices go into use for five, six, seven, eight year, 10 year life cycles. So you have to plan how you're going to manage technology changes. And so thinking connectivity ahead becomes more and more critical in the overall business um, approaches. More and more hybrid technologies are being used. Hybrid, SAT, and uh, uh, and and uh, cellular, hybrid cellular types, CDMA plus GSM if you're in certain parts of the world, hybrid cellular, two carriers, maybe three carriers, four carriers in the same device. We've got some devices today that have got four carrier networks, SIM cards, in a single device, providing ultra high bandwidth services, in this particular case, for the buses on the Google campus. Very, very interesting applications. Um, the use cases in M2M are hugely different. They vary from using kilobytes of traffic in a month, do that over satellite or do it over cellular, to now gigabytes in a month. And so the economics change. What works in a domestic marketplace if you're using 30 KB doesn't work if you're using a gigabyte and go to multiple marketplaces. Because roaming is a lousy alternative uh, in, in our industry uh, if you want to go that route. You've got to have regional domestic networks. Uh, so th that's kind of the, 
wrap that I wanted to put on this pretty, I hope, high speed and I hope vaguely useful um, slot in the agenda this afternoon. It's a very, very interesting area as you start to uh, uh, push applications and services out into new marketplaces. Lots of considerations. And more and more, as enterprises are taking control of this marketplace, and less and less, frankly, the ASP is taking control of it, uh, I think that the long-term planning of how these services are going to be uh, deployed becomes more and more critical at the CIO levels. With that, thank you very much indeed. I'll hand you over to our next speakers.